All right, so next is the topic of cell division. We're going to look at reproduction at the cellular level. So the process that um, each one of our cells go through to make copies so that uh, we can continue to build new tissues and uh, replace ones that have worn out. So um, first thing we're going to look at here is kind of a looking at the whole organism in this case a Komodo dragon but normally um, living things reproduce two ways either sexual reproduction where there's a male and a female egg and sperm that that process or um, more simple organisms or, or cells even might have the ability to reproduce simply by um, sort of pairing off, budding, and making two copies of itself. The one thing that I want to touch on here is this process called parthenogenesis, which is just um, kind of a weird thing that, that certain living things have, have evolved the capability to do. There was a Komodo dragon in a zoo. I don't remember exactly where it was in the world, but it was a female and it was the only Komodo dragon in the entire um, enclosure. And um, at some point, the, the zookeepers found that it had laid eggs. And you probably are aware if you eat eggs, chicken eggs, it, you know, eggs don't necessarily need to be fertilized for a female to lay eggs. But, of course, the eggs, if they aren't fertilized, don't hatch into chicks. Well, this female that was all by herself in a pen without a male laid eggs and they actually hatched into Komodo dragons. And so um, what was going on here was this ability for, um, for a species that normally reproduces sexually to reproduce asexually. Again, it's really rare in vertebrates, really rare. But um, the, the uh, Komodo dragon as sort of a survival mechanism, imagine your species is dwindling in numbers and there aren't very many of you left, meaning a male and a female may not even find each other. And uh, in that case, again, not anything can do this, but in, in those kinds of rare cases, the species has retained this adaptation to be able to reproduce um, without the need for a member of the opposite sex. A little bit of this was going on in, in the back theme of Jurassic Park, right? They had uh, uh, said something like, you know, all the, all the dinosaurs are females. That way they can't ever reproduce and, and overrun the world. Uh, and yet they did because they retained some amphibian DNA. And there are fish species and amphibian species, things like frogs, that... Um, can actually mutate. So for example, again, if, if the population has a lot of males in it and not very many females, the population would tend to decline in numbers in that kind of condition. But what happens or what can happen is that some of those males basically become females. Um, and then, you know, they, they can reproduce with uh, the more abundant males and, and make offspring that are viable. And so that's kind of what was going on in the background with Jurassic Park, that some of the dinosaurs were sort of spontaneously changing sexes because there were nothing but females. Really, there's only two things about life that matter, survival and reproduction. Every living thing on the planet from single cell bacteria to, uh, to any other uh, living thing, including humans, Really, we, we all fight for survival, and that's in order for us to reproduce and propagate the species. So you have these very rare instances where there are some different kind of interesting mutations that can happen.
But with that said, ultimately all life begins as a single cell. That single cell either is fertilized if it's sexual reproduction or it undergoes cell division, which again is what we're going to be talking about today. And then that single cell splits into two cells. Each of those two cells split into two. And so you go from one cell to two to four to eight to 16 until you get billions or trillions of them, for example, making up a human body. But ultimately all life uh, either begins as a single cell or obviously there are single-celled organisms like bacteria that, that are always single cells, but they still have to reproduce, make copies of themselves, and it all uh, involves this same process. In my mind, it's still one of the most um, amazing things, if not the most amazing thing about life, that we can start uh, humans or, or mammals in general or, or most living things as a single cell um, an egg cell that gets fertilized by a sperm cell in our case, and that those single cells divide and divide and divide until those single cells differentiate into skin tissue and hair tissue and heart and lung and all of our organs and all the different uh, muscle tissues. And, and usually that process that again has to happen billions or trillions of times um, usually works um, and results in a, in, a, in a viable, you know, average, normal, whatever you want to call it, looking version of that living thing. And just the fact that that happens um, still is just um, one of the most interesting things that, that I just think about often because of how complex a process it is. And we're going to touch on that process obviously in this lecture, um, but still just boggles the mind how that can happen and, and it works most every time. And of course what drives that process or what dictates um, how you look based on how your parents looked or what characteristics you have, your eye color, your hair color, your general body type or any of those things is all based on the genome, the, the pool of genes that um, a given species sort of has at its disposal to be able to um, make new copies of itself. So in, in every cell there's a pretty much a complete set of DNA. Uh, in other words, a, a complete set of instructions or a recipe for, for what you are, or what a frog is, or what a, a Gila monster is, or, or anything. And just the fact that we've figured that out, and now we apply that in so many different ways to be able to solve crimes, be able to you know, find samples of DNA left behind at a crime scene, and all it even takes today is just like one little cell, one cell off your body, one little tiny bit of skin cell or hair or any other cell from your body. And um, we have the technology to duplicate that, make copies of it, which is what we're going to do in lab in, in a few weeks for those of you in lab. And uh, to be able to then develop a fingerprint, basically a genetic fingerprint that tells exactly who you are. And the fact that that information is contained in every one of our cells, each of our 46 chromosomes code for everything about us, every characteristic about us, um, 3 billion DNA subunits uh, composed of only four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and, uh, and then 30,000 genes. Just the code for proteins. And again, that's just proteins. That's not everything about a human. So um, every cell contains a complete complement of DNA. And um, we're going to use some terminology, um, terminology like diploid, uh, 
somatic cell. Somatic cells are the cells that are everywhere in our body except for our um, testes or ovaries. So every skin cell, heart, heart cell, everything else except for the cells in our testes and ovaries contain two complete matched sets of, of uh, chromosomes, all 46 of those. And we refer to that as the diploid number. Di meaning two, so two matched sets of chromosomes. The sex cells, um, or what we call gametes, that are found in our testes and ovaries only contain half of that, one set of those 23 chromosomes. And so that's important because Again, for sexual reproduction, you need um, a contribution from one parent and a contribution from the other parent. So half of your DNA comes from your mom, half from your dad. And then that makes the full diploid number of chromosomes in you or in the offspring of any other living thing that reproduces sexually. So um, another terminology that, that we use in reference to this is homologous. There are 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, including the, um, the X and Y chromosomes that determine your, your sex, male or female. And um, we see a, what's called a karyotype here on the screen, where um, basically this process can be done that, that um, you know, pulls out and identifies those, those pairs of chromosomes and they are then arranged by length. Notice pair number one is the longest pair of chromosomes, 22, the shortest, and then in this case, um, the X chromosome. And uh, again, we can determine by looking at these karyotypes, for example, a lot of things, but for example, if there are any obvious abnormalities um, that could result in um, birth defects or um, genetic disorders, those kinds of things. Again, these are, these are things, these are types of information that, that you know, we, we haven't known for all that long in, in the big picture of science. And now we're able to apply this information to, uh, to know more about uh, species, who we are. So first thing we want to do then, or the next thing we want to do is actually look at the structure of DNA or, or a chromosome, which is obviously composed of DNA. So each of these 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, and again, homologous just means uh, like the same, right? Homo, similar, same. So these are pairs of chromosomes that basically match up. And again, this is important because um, when these um, chromosomes split to make a copy of the cell, then one of each of these pairs go to each of the two daughter cells. That way each of the daughter cells, the offspring, when the cell divides from one into two, each of the daughter cells get um, one of each of the exact same chromosomes. So each daughter cell has the exact same DNA. Now again, that it's different when now you're talking about um, repro sexual reproduction. I'm just talking in reference to the reproduction of a cell, not a, a whole species. Um, so we look at sort of from the small to the big. We see the chromos uh, the DNA strand on the right of the of the slide in that sort of double helix we refer to it as. I always kind of call it like, it looks like a bit of a spiral staircase. And so you have the, the backbone, the two strands, and then you have all the individual pairs that, um, that make up sort of the rungs of the ladder. And we'll get into DNA structure a little later. But basically this slide just shows you the relationship between a strand of DNA and the chromosome. The strand of DNA, when the cell gets ready to reproduce, because it's not this way all the time, but when the cell gets ready to reproduce, the DNA strand starts 
wrapping itself around these little proteins called histones, and they're the little blue or purple circles there. And so you notice the DNA strand starts winding itself around those histones, and so you're making these little bundles of histones. Then those start winding themselves into another coil, and then that coils further and further as you get to the left of that image until that ultimately you get that sort of X-shaped homologous pair of chromosomes, which again are composed of the DNA strands and the, uh, the histone um, protein, the histones, which are the proteins and the DNA all wrapped together. So you only see the chromosomes when the cell is actually ready to make a copy of itself, because otherwise the DNA is all unraveled and uh, it's so small that it's uh, not, not visible in the cell. It's there, obviously, but it's just not visible. Another way we've applied this knowledge is to um, sort of helping species of, of living things and understanding how susceptible they are to problems like becoming endangered or, or possibly going extinct. A lot of species have come and gone uh, extinct while humans have become the dominant thing on the planet. Destroying habitat, messing up their homes, hunting things to, to extinction. But now we're trying to use the knowledge, the science we know about DNA to help things from going extinct. And um, one of the many species that we're studying, of course, with respect to genetics, and more specifically, how diverse the genetic pool is, because the more diverse our gene pool is, the less likely we are to go extinct. And so the cheetah is one of the species that's been heavily studied because um, at one point their numbers were very, very few, kind of like California condors and a lot of other species. Once a population of living things declines to where there are not very many of them, in the case of the California condor, we were down to maybe like less than 20 alive on the entire planet. When something's sort of, um, well, when, when it's abundant, when there are lots of, of given things, you know, when there are a lot of individuals of a given species, um, you know, they live in, in, in different places, they're, they're exposed to different habitats, their gene pool tends to be a little more diverse. Uh, the genetic diversity is greater. And what that helps then is, is if there's a disease, some of the individuals might die, but they don't all typically die because they have diversity in their gene pool. And, and whereas some individuals may be susceptible to a disease, others are resistant. No different in the human population. Some people catch every cold that's anywhere near them. Every year they get the flu, and other people just don't ever get sick. They don't catch the flu. Some people die from taking aspirin, and, uh, and some people have a high tolerance. So that diversity in our genetic make makeup just help us survive. And so when you get to be so few, you lose a lot of that genetic diversity and that puts the species at risk to go extinct. Now, I don't know if you've been paying attention here. The image on the screen talks about genetic diversity in the cheetah. And um, when I was preparing this slide uh, several years ago, I Googled cheetah so I could get an image of a cheetah. And this was literally the first image popped up, so I'm like, cool, that'll work. Well. Do any of you notice what's wrong with this picture? And again, you can always pause it here and, and look at it and think about it, but the answer is that this isn't a cheetah. Just an example, an unfortunate, obvious example, um, and a too, too abundant example of don't trust the internet, because this isn't a cheetah, it's actually a jaguar. But yet, I didn't write that on the, on the slide. This image 
said genetic diversity of the cheetah and it was talking about the cheetah's gene pool being really diminished because they were hunted down to maybe just a, a couple hundred at the most left on the planet and we've done a good job since then of protecting the cheetah you know helping breed it in captivity protecting the populations in so many ways and and the population of cheetahs has has grown to, to uh, quite a few, nowhere near what it was before we started hunting them because of their, their beautiful fur. And by the way, this is actually a cheetah. And again, it's, other than them both having spots, if you look carefully, there's very little else they have in common. And yet somebody totally screwed up and got this wrong on the internet. The problem though, and it's the same problem with the condor, and any other species that is declined in numbers, even if we make a lot of them in the future, even if we protect them and breed them and help them survive, the gene pool gets constricted because so many of the individual populations have been eliminated. And so all that's left is the gene pool from a relatively few individuals. In the short term, hundreds of years, which is short-term genetically speaking, the cheetahs, every cheetah on this planet is really not that unrelated to every other cheetah on the planet. They're, they're more close relatives. And it's, it's a problem called inbreeding, where you have closer relatives that are breeding with each other. And so no matter how many times that happens, you can make a lot of cheetahs but they just can't gain genetic diversity in, in the short run. And so even though we've brought these guys back from the brink of extinction, we've done the same with condors, there's still a lot of worry that it might not take much for them to just still go extinct, even though there are a lot more today than there used to be. And again, that's all because of the lack, in this case, of genetic diversity. So we'll be talking more about genetics in a, in a future chapter, so we'll kind of cap off that discussion and get back to talking uh, a little more genetics later. But now I want to kind of backtrack again to, to the main topic of this chapter, which is um, cell division, the ability of each of our individual cells to make copies of themselves and uh, carry on that process. So. What this involves is the cell cycle. The cycle, which is more or less about every 24 hours where there's an orderly series of events that um, provide individual cells to be able to grow and then divide from one cell into two daughter cells. We call them daughter cells, the parent cell making uh, copies of all the genetics inside and then dividing into two new daughter cells. And it truly is a, a cycle. It, it, the cycle can stop or change, slow down, but, but basically it involves a roughly 24-hour cycle. And, and the background image that you see on this slide pretty much has every stage of the cell cycle represented in it. And we'll, we'll look at those. But we start by kind of looking at the two main phases that happen during this cycle in which we have interphase, which takes most of the time. And this is the process of the cell growing, the DNA inside of the nucleus of the cell making copies so that the two daughter cells will each have a copy of the DNA from the parent cell. So most of the time the cell does that. And then for a relatively short amount of the cycle, we are in the mitotic phase or mitosis where the cell is actually making the copy of itself, dividing in other words from one to two daughter cells. So we can look at this cycle um, as a wheel sort of, you know, notice the arrows. So you see at the sort of the one o'clock position, if you were thinking of this as a clock, is the mitotic phase. And we'll talk about what each of those sections of that pie are, followed by another short phase called cytokinesis. And then the rest of the cycle is the interphase, 
which is broken down into three phases, including also a fourth one, which is when the cell uh, might just kind of go into hibernation where, where the, the process just kind of stops or arrests. And that would be the case if, um, you know, we don't need to make any more copies, everything's, you know, well, we don't need to do anything different. The cell cycle might actually stop for a period of time until it's actually needed again. It's kind of like charging your phone. You know, when your phone's charging, it's because it needs energy. Once it's full, then it pretty much is done until it needs that energy again. And so that interphase is broken down into two gap phases, G1 and G2, which are intersected by an S phase, S for synthesis. Let me see here. So um, there's a little more detail in your book, but basically the, uh, the interface sec uh, sections um, ha happen in that G1 is when everything inside of the cell is duplicated. So when we were talking about in a prior chapter about the, uh, the what's in a cell, it has ribosomes and it has different organelles, the Golgi complex, and all of those organelles play an important role in, in the cell functioning. And so again, when you're going to go from one cell to two cells, you need to make copies of everything in that cell. So G1 is when everything is, is, is copied or duplicated, except for the chromosomes, which happens later. So the cell starts preparing for mitosis by making copies of everything so that there's enough for both daughter cells. Then the uh, cell goes into the synthesis phase where the actual chromosomes are duplicated. So again, each daughter cell needs to have a complete complement of the 46 chromosomes. So at that point, the 46 chromosomes are doubled, basically, temporarily. And then before, right before mitosis happens, the G2 phase, the GAP2 phase, where if you think about it, right, the, the cell is pretty complicated and, and there's a lot going on and, and the DNA is complicated. And so there are some kind of what I always call quality control phases. If things go wrong, if things are screwed up, copies aren't right, something's wrong, something's missing, um, your cell has this kind of quality control phase where it double checks to make sure chromosomes were duplicated properly. Uh, and, and it looks for any other errors that might have occurred. Again, we're talking about something microscopic, but it's still super um, complicated. And, and so there's a lot going on in this 24-hour period, roughly. So once everything has been quality control checked, then the cell actually goes into mitosis. Now, of, of course, we know that sometimes errors happen, um, and, and so not every problem is checked. Not every problem is caught, I should say. We know, hum and we always talk about anything that humans do is prone to human error. If a human is making something, that human can have a bad day and, and screw up something. So even at the cellular level, we are human and we still make mistakes. A lot of those mistakes get caught and they get eliminated before they would become a problem. But yet we know that um, there are um, a lot of things that are born with deformities, you know, um, two-headed snakes. I'm just thinking like of, of pets and, and animals that we might see, things that are born albino, things that are born with extra f digits. You know, there's a whole genetic strain of six-toed or, or more polydactyl cats um, that, that are, you know, that pop up in a population. Some of the defects are not bad enough to cause problems, health problems. Some are lethal. Some um, result in, in death of a, of a fetus or an embryo before it even comes close to being born. Other defects, especially human uh, birth defects, um, 
can be managed, some can be treated. And certainly with our knowledge of genetics growing by the day, you know, I think there's hope that at some point in the future that, um, you know, doctors or at least some doctors are, are shooting for the ability to be able to identify problems and, and even sort of fix them, you know, genetically fix them before that fetus or, or, uh, is, is fully developed or, or born. But we know there are errors that, that do still manage to happen. And, and again, it, it really shouldn't be surprising with, again, the, the billions of times this process happens that, that occasionally uh, errors pop up. So um, the actual stages of mitosis. So we talked generally about the interphase part of the cell cycle, which is most of the time. And then once everything's been copied and everything's ready to go, then mitosis occurs, which is when the cell actually goes through the process of, of making one cell into two cells. And for the purpose of us humans studying mitosis, we've broken it down into four or more stages. When I was in college, um, you know, back in the Stone Age, we only had prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then cytokinesis is the very last step when the cells become separate. Now some books even have um, many other sort of intermediate stages based on what's happening inside the cell. Our book goes with prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And so we'll, uh, we'll go with that uh, way of breaking down mitosis. But keep in mind, it's, it's not a um, discrete process. You don't go from prophase to suddenly you're in metaphase, and then suddenly you're in anaphase, and suddenly you're in telophase. Again, it's like watching a movie, not watching um, you know, a few different photographs of the movie, still frames every, you know, it'd be like watching an hour-long movie versus um, just one photograph every 15 minutes during the movie. You'd have no idea what was going on if you saw four images of a movie as opposed to watching the entire movie happen. So sometimes when you're actually looking at these cells under a microscope, like we'll be doing in lab, um, this coming week, for those of you in lab, um, you, you look for indicators of which phase you're closest to, but you'll find lots of examples where eh, it's between metaphase and anaphase, or it's between prophase and prometaphase. So again, don't think of it as being five separate things. It's just one continuous thing that we stop and look at every so often to identify it. So we'll look at each of those phases and, and the main things that, that we look for to indicate what phase we're actually in. So pro phase, meaning like first phase, right? Or beginning phase. So we've got a, um, an actual image of a cell on the left and then a drawing depicting the exact same thing on the right. And so what starts happening, we know we're in prophase when we start seeing things changing in the nucleus. So in the, in the photograph on the left, the nucleus is that darker spot in the middle. But what you notice now is that rather than, if you look at the little, the cell that's at like the 10 o'clock position, it's got a nice dark, circle that's the nucleus. When prophase starts, which that cell is not in prophase yet, but in the middle of the screen that cell is in prophase because we see the nucleus isn't obvious anymore. It's starting to break down. The membrane that makes the nucleus separate, a separate organ now, starts to go away. And that's because obviously the chromosomes are in there as indicated by the red and blue X's on the diagram. And, and ultimately, they've copied, right, in, in uh, interphase, 
and now those chromosomes have to get out of there so that they can be separated into two cells. So we start seeing the nuclear membrane breaking down, which is the dotted line there. We start seeing um, a spindle apparatus begin to form, which is that sort of thing in the upper right there of the diagram on the right. Those two black um, structures that are oriented, one's kind of up and down, the other one side to side, and there's two sets of those. And then those spindles, those fibers that go between them, those are actually what are going to help to pull and push the cell apart from one to two cells. And then the other thing we notice is when we look at the nucleus, the DNA is coiling up and what we call our, our chromatin fibers, and they start coiling up enough, going from long, skinny things to shorter, fatter things, so we can actually see them. In the, the photographic image, notice there are those black sort of lines inside of the nucleus compared to just a solid black color in the nucleus to the upper left of that image. So you look at that um, cell, and again, because the nuclear membrane's going away, because you can start seeing the individual chromosomes, and then um, at sort of the one o'clock and seven o'clock position of the photograph uh, from the nucleus, that's the equivalent to the spindle fibers in the diagram there. So again, those two kind of dark areas where you kind of see things radiating out in all directions, those are the spindle fibers that are again going to work to pull and push the cell into two separate daughter cells. Um, so prometaphase is, is in between those two. And again, your book describes each of these phases. Um, so there are some subtle differences when you leave prophase, but before you get into metaphase, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to metaphase because that's the, the next phase that has some real obvious kind of uh, landmarks. So first thing is the spindle is fully formed. So again, in the, in the drawing image, you see the two spindle, um, those, those little um, uh, centromeres, the two little sort of um, cylinders that are oriented up and down and side to side that are on either side of the cell um, are there. All of the, the little microtubules, the spindle apparatus, the whole thing is, is ready to go. And then you also notice that all of the chromosomes are lined up along what we would call the equator of the cell, the, the center of the cell. So we can see that in the drawing, and it refers to that as the metaphase plate, the fact that those chromosomes are lined up in a straight line. And uh, that allows those <coughs> spindle fibers to be attached to each of the halves of the chromosome. So one half of the chromosome, the other half makes the X. Fingers won't bend that way anymore, but, um, and so then those spindle fibers are, are attached to that little center dot area. And then those spindle fibers play what, what the book says, a tug of war that basically pulls that chromosome apart. Remember it's, duplicated itself, so now there's double, and so each one of the new daughter cells is going to get a full set of those chromosomes, and the way that that gets separated out is because those, um, those microtubules, those spindle fibers, grab onto the chromosomes and pull them apart. So again, when you can see the chromosomes lined up and it's, and it's in a nice perfect straight line, you know you're right in the middle of metaphase. The chromosomes could still be kind of migrating to form a straight line, or they could just be starting to pull apart. 
and so that's why I said, you know, you could you could even extend this out into early metaphase, late metaphase, but but this image shows an exact um, example of when you're right in the middle of what metaphase would be considered. So then the next step is for the uh, cell to start separating the chromosomes. So the the centrioles pull on the spindle fibers, those little Again, those little cylinders, the centrioles, start pulling on the spindle fibers to shorten them. The, uh, <clears throat> um, I keep trying to get my mouse back here. There are other tubules, and if you look at the photographic image, you see those dark kind of clusters. Those are the chromosomes, which are now actually called sister chromatids. Again, sister, because each half of each one is going towards a new sister cell or daughter cell. Um, but you also notice in between the chromosomes are some lines, some more, some more fibers, microtubules in this case. So you've got um, fibers that are shortening and pulling the chromosomes away from each other, the sister chromatids now. And you also have fibers that are pushing those sister chromatids apart. So both of those things are happening together to separate the, um, the each half of the, the copied chromosome to opposite poles of, of the cell. And so when you start seeing the sister chromatids being pulled apart, then you know you're in anaphase. The easiest way to describe what's happening in telophase is that it's the exact opposite of prophase. So notice in this case, um, you can see that there are two separate slides, right? The cells have their own separate cell membrane now. You can still see those, those fibers, though, connecting the sister chromatids. Um, and those fibers still kind of go between the two. So in this telophase, the cells haven't become completely separate yet. But what's happening is those chromosomes uh, are now starting to unravel again. So they're starting to slowly go from being visible, those dark masses, to unraveling and, and basically getting too small to see again. You're starting to rebuild the membrane around them, the nuclear membrane that surrounds the chromosomes. And um, you're seeing those fibers slowly kind of disappearing again. And then cytokinesis is just the, the very last step where you cleave the cells to be separate cells from each other. So cytokinesis is just sort of the very, very end of telophase, when now you have two new cells, you can see the nuclear membrane in each cell, the DNA is unraveled and it's gone invisible, and you don't see any sign of the spindle uh, at all, because it's um, not needed now. So in animal cells, like what we're seeing here, the way that the cell actually goes from two, like we see in that image, telophase, to going through cytokinesis is through what's called a cleavage furrow. And basically, there's this ring of fibers or filaments, myosin and actin, that sort of work like, you know, you have a um, a really squishy kind of balloon and you put a really tight rubber band around it and then you know let go of the rubber band and maybe the the balloon has uh, got enough movement that the rubber band can squeeze it down. Now, obviously the balloon doesn't just separate into two balloons, it would pop probably or it would just come together but um, these myosin and actin filaments form a ring that contracts and then eventually kind of breaks the cell into two separate cells. And then we now have two separate cells that are going to start going through interphase. 
making copies and getting the DNA ready and then eventually those two cells will make um, copies again and, and on and on and on until the whole process is done. Now again, you know, I can describe it to you, you can read it in the book and all that's uh, definitely interesting, but it's always pretty cool to watch this happen as well and see the process actually um, happening, a real cell that's actually going through cell division. So I don't think I'll run this whole thing, but we'll start it anyway.
<clears throat> All right, so let's see if I can go back here. Sorry. All right, so um, same thing happens in a plant cell, and, and like the, the video clip talked about, one of the only differences is, of course, plant cells have chloroplasts, and so those have to be duplicated as well in the interphase. But the other main difference, um, as far as the actual process, is how the cells actually go from uh, the end of telophase through cytokinesis. As we already talked about in an animal cell, there's a cleavage furrow and the contractile ring that pinches down and, and separates the cells. In a plant cell, it's a little different. You actually have Golgi vesicles that form a cell plate. And then that cell plate um, eventually leads to new walls, new cell walls being constructed. And then at the end of that process um, in a plant cell, you now have two separate cells. So instead of this, the cell being kind of pinched by the contractile ring, um, you actually get these organelles, Golgi vesicles, that fuse together to form a new cell plate that leads to two new cell walls. So that's the only other uh, predominant difference in uh, plant cells. Otherwise, mitosis is going to look exactly the same, whether it's an animal cell or a plant cell. All the photographic images we saw in the previous slides were all animal cells, but again, it, it, it would be the exact same thing, plant or animal cell. <clears throat> and then we've already um, kind of gone through talking about the uh, the steps during interphase. The only thing that we didn't specifically talk more about was the um, uh, the the G zero phase. So after mitosis, if the um, uh, cells don't really need to make another copy of themselves at that point, they go into this sort of hibernation phase, G G zero phase, and um, it can be a temporary thing that, that could happen. It could be in the G0 phase for hours or, 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 or longer until um, the cell is triggered to then go back in to G1 phase. Or, again, just depending on the cells and the situation, a cell could go into the hibernation phase permanently. For the rest of the life of that cell, it doesn't make another copy of itself, again, because it might not need to make a copy of itself. So you're just sort of wasting energy and uh, resources if you're making copies that just aren't, aren't needed. And uh, then, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier on as well, there are these quality control checkpoints to make sure that each time the cell does something that it, it did it correctly. And so there's a G1 checkpoint uh, after the synthesis phase and during the growth phase, there's another G2 checkpoint. <clears throat> there's also a checkpoint midway through mitosis before the actual formation of two separate daughter cells. Again, one last chance to make sure that everything inside of that cell that's undergoing mitosis is correct. Everything was done correctly. Now again, it means doesn't mean that that errors don't still find their way through, but the cell does have several <clears throat> quality control checkpoints along the way. And then the last thing, which which really is a very similar process is that if, if it's a single-celled organism like a bacterium, it actually still has to make copies of itself. It still does undergo reproduction. But in a prokaryotic organism like a bacterium, the process of the cell uh, 
making copies of itself is called fission, binary fission. Again, bi sort of meaning two. So the process of the cell duplicating itself. And so um, there's a section of your book as well that, uh, that talks about that process. It's not quite as complicated as it is in a eukaryotic cell like the ones we've been talking about. But the, um, but the um, in this case, if it's a bacterium, they still have to, you know, make copies of the genetic material. The um, material still has to ultimately <clears throat> um, sort of separate itself. There still is a cleavage furrow that forms, and then the genetic material gets kind of isolated into each of the daughter cells that eventually pinches off and... Uh, and then each of those daughter cells at some point will probably make copies of themselves. So really, every, every individual cell in our body is still a single cell that makes a copy of itself, but because we're eukaryotic and we have a little more complexity to our cells, um, it's a little different process than the more simplified a process that a single-celled organism undergoes to make copies of itself. So um, again, that's kind of the quick overview of uh, cellular division or cell reproduction. And then we'll be uh, getting into um, several of the, of the subsequent chapters that talk a little more about DNA and genetics and, uh, and then progress through that process even there's a, a biotech chapter in the book that we don't cover, just again because there isn't enough time to cover all of the content. But certainly if you're interested in, in the way science is trending, which is probably more and more into the biotechnology, uh, then I would, I would certainly uh, recommend that you read that chapter. All right, so that's it for, the, for this chapter. On to the next one.